Thank you, Tim. And uh, so I was asked to uh, uh, give sort of a, a scientific perspective. And I, the first question was, are we stressing out the Arctic? And I was going to just text yes. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I have, I'll give you a little more context. And Tim gave an excellent introduction to even some of the things I hope to say here. Uh, as we started this whole conversation, Canada is an Arctic nation. Uh, it depends how you define the Arctic, but uh, using sort of a, a maybe an ecological definition, approximately one half of this country is Arctic and two thirds of its coastline. So we have stewardship over a tremendous part of, of the Arctic and it's very important. There's no question from a scientific perspective the Arctic is changing and changing very rapidly and disproportionately. I think that's something we have to keep uh, emphasizing. Uh, the problem is very serious. Um, there's certainly no, you know, we, I was just commenting on a, um, a, a poll released yesterday. Uh, it was in CBC and places like that, and uh, they were asked me to comment on it. And there really is a disconnect, I think, between what the science and what the northern peoples know and what many southerners believe about climate change and how serious the problem is. is really has been this disconnect in information. The simple reality is the Arctic is warming about twice and sometimes more than so more southern regions. And you can see that in the instrumental records, you can see it in the records, the long-term paleoenvironmental records that even my lab and other people in this, this room can show. Uh, the science is in. People ask, well, why is the Arctic so disproportionately warming? And again, I think most of you in the audience know, but it's it probably good to, to repeat it. Uh, there's many reasons why the Arctic is so incredibly sensitive, but a lot of it has to do that the Arctic in its natural state is primarily white. It's reflective. It's ice and snow. Uh, once you start warming the planet and you start losing that ice and snow, it melts, it, it heats up much more quickly. Uh, to use an analogy, we came here on a hot August day in the parking lot in the backyard here. You put your hand on a white car and a black car, they'd both be hot, but the black car would be a lot hotter. It has lower reflectivity, uh, so it, it, it is absorbing much more heat. The Arctic in its natural state is like the white car. It's reflecting more of the heat. You start losing some of that white, which is ice and snow and sea ice. You're getting more like that black car. It heats up more. It melts more snow and ice. I don't want to say you have a snowball effect, but you get a snowball effect to happening. This, of course, is very serious. It's a disproportionate warming. Um, and it also leads to what we call feedback loops and thresholds. At a certain point, uh, some, of these, some of this warming will start releasing more greenhouse gases and the whole situation gets much worse. You know, we're now in a Paris Agreement, if, you know, let's assume we meet any of the targets in the Paris Agreement. They're attempting to keep the Paris Agreement warming up to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Even that is, it seems to be almost impossible for some nations to grasp. The, if you're in the Arctic, that's already going to translate to a 3 degree, degree centigrade change. So again, even our Paris targets are disproportionately more, which we think are such, such nice targets to try and shoot for, is still going to result in a doubling of that warming in Arctic regions. And if you go to the business as usual model, if we don't meet the Paris targets and we just keep sending off greenhouse gases, it's too horrific even to think about. We're talking about 8 to 12 degrees temperature change in Arctic. These are astounding numbers. Even with the limited warming we've already seen, we see tremendous changes. We get better get we better get ready for more changes. Uh, we keep talking about reducing fossil fuels, but the latest numbers I have in 2017 we were up 1.7 percent in releases of carbon, and 2018 we're 2.7 percent higher. So, uh, the recent United Nations Secretary General had an interesting quote that came out today. Uh, it says we've with climate warming we've dug ourselves into a hole, and we're saying we're trying to get out of the hole, but we're still digging. Uh, and this is really a serious issue. Tim's already brought up some of the issues I would have said as evidence. We don't, I don't know how much more evidence need, but some of these have critical social and economic and ecological consequences. Sea ice declining, it's a classic one. Uh, Tim knows this better than anyone in this room, but the sea, the sea ice is not just ice. It's, it's the highways, it's the ways people get around. Uh, on the uh, ice roads, for example, going north, where a lot of food and other supplies, those are no longer, in many places, no longer accessible because of warming. This, this links to many other things, never mind the ecology of the regions, the social and economic. It, it relates to food security. It relates to what you can eat, how much your food costs, and can you actually afford it? If, you know, we're talking about full loss, uh, losses in some areas. 
this is changing the, 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 the food that's available. We're shifting from different animals who are not, not so well adapted to the open sea ice conditions. Um, and everyone knows the northern peoples are extremely adaptable, but at what threshold do we go far, just too far over where nothing is available? Another one, uh, maybe I mentioned, there's so many examples, and I think many of you know this. I'll give you one more. We have some experts here in the room, so I'll be careful what I say. But permafrost thaw is, again, another, a critical factor. It has incredible ecological environmental consequences. It's changing how the, the terrestrial ecosystems change, how the freshwater ecosystems change. But if you want to come to something that really people see right in front of their eyes, the infrastructure is falling apart. The, the water that's permafrost is defined as ground that's frozen at least two years in a row. It's like rock, it's the concrete of the Arctic. The glue that keeps that concrete together is the frozen water. If you start melting that frozen water, your concrete foundation is falling apart. You're seeing houses fall apart, you're seeing roads fall apart, you're seeing uh, Iqaluit uh, Airport having issues as well. Uh, there's a recent study said about one third of the infrastructure in the circumpolar north will be subjected to this thaw instability in the next four decades. We're talking, you know, billions of dollars potentially. This, and that's just what we see in the infrastructure. Incredible amount of carbon is contained in things like permafrost and frozen soils. If these start thawing, that carbon, we reach these thresholds, these positive feedbacks, that carbon starts going back up into the atmosphere. So we start getting these feedbacks and these positive, and you know, the whole situation is really, uh, you know, almost too difficult to even think about. We're talking a lot about climate change here, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about climate change. But I'd like to say there's a lot more going on in the Arctic. Climate is the really big one, but the North is affected by many other things. And I'm currently writing a book, and a subheading in one of the book is, is what happens in the South doesn't stay in the South. Now, you can say that's true of greenhouse gases, but it's true of a lot of other things. And again, there's experts in this room, so I have to be careful what I say. But... Uh, for example, there's insecticides and other persistent organic pollutants and other contaminants that we use in the South for agriculture and so forth, never been used in the Arctic. But because of the way pollutants move, so-called grasshopper effect or the cold condensation, these pollutants hop north. They also hop up altitude. And eventually get to the Arctic, there's no place left for them to go, so they stay there. So many pollutants that were never used in the Arctic are now accumulating in the Arctic. And this, of course, has things like PCBs, DDT, insecticides. This has issues of food security. And again, it's, it's again one of the things that, that um, uh, they say is especially northern peoples who use uh, food, country food high up on the food chain are especially susceptible to this because of bioaccumulation and so on and so forth. The things like seal are very high, uh, very high in these contaminants as it goes through the food web. Well, I said what happens in the south doesn't stay in the south. Uh, what I, my final chapter says what happens in the north doesn't stay in the north. And just to conclude, what I'm talking about here affects us all. People say, well, you know, the Arctic, uh, you know, it's far away. And people have this feeling it's far away. But let's be selfish about it if you're living in the south. It's going to affect all of us. Uh, if you're living by the coast, just the melting, the melting of uh, land-based ice in places like uh, Greenland, the Canadian Arctic, Antarctica, and so forth, that's raising water levels. Raising water levels has all sorts of implications for people in the south. When you have hurricanes, you have a more serious hurricane, you have more flooding. All this is all related. We, we can't, uh, can't really say that. At Greenland, we have this recent heat wave in 2019. We just had this enormous heat wave. In one day alone this summer, it's estimated in one day alone, the ice sheet shed about 7 billion tons of melt. That's enough to fill almost 3 billion Olympic swimming side swimming pools. And that happened in one day. So, um, you know, we, have, we keep talking about urgency um, and uh, Again, the UN Secretary of State had, a, I think, a final good quote I'll leave with him. Climate change is running faster than we are, and mm -hmm. I think it's time that we really have to deal with this issue. So, thank you. That makes me think that polar bears can run faster than we can, too. <laughs>